like very, very many other companies, uh, Wärtsilä is joining Dunsu Shipping Meet year after year. And today we will be listening to Wärtsilä again, how to harnessing the new technologies to unlock shipping's potential. Listen to Jürgen Strandberg, Director of Innovation at Wärtsilä Voyage. He has been at sea for 15 years and 10 years within shipping management. Welcome, you're again. Stage is yours. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome to my little corner of the world. Uh, today, uh, we in Wärtsilä, we have two speaker slots, right? So, first it's me, now uh, talking about Wärtsilä Voyage, uh, the soft product. And later on at 3 o'clock, it's going to be Roger Holm uh, talking about uh, equipment, engines, and, and all the other cool stuff that he has at his display. There was a lot of talk this morning about decarbonization, and of course, uh, an important part of decarbonization is that the vessel, the assets you use are low emission vessels. Uh, good engines, uh, good fuels, um, lean drag, all of that. But also, we need to perform low emission trips. And this is where Wärtsilä Voyage come in. This is what I will focus on quite a bit in my little thing here. And not to forget the logistics of the whole picture. Are we transporting the most clever way the goods uh, that are supposed to be en ending up at somebody's dinner table or um, equipment box? So just so you know, this is the smart trips. Later on, it's the smart equipment. Now, if you look at decarbonization, one of the things about decarbonization is you can start today and you can have results today. One of the leanest way, one of the most uh, uh, efficient way to start decarbonization is to ma manage the way you perform your voyages. No matter what your ship is today, you can actually move it to be a better vessel already tomorrow. No need for a dry dock, no need for a fuel system change or anything like that. We have the tools to start doing it tomorrow and your return on investment is normally within a month. So what are we going to focus on? Well, it's actually logical, and all the nautical people in here already know this. We need to do the best route for the trip intended. It has to be clever according to the current weather, uh, depth, uh, ocean currents, and, and what have you. You also need to manage the speed you perform this trip with, and best is if it is uh, a just-in-time arrival in agreement with the port terminal pilots and, and all authorities. And of course, you want your asset to have the lowest drag through water. What does that mean? Well, you have to have a clean hull, a clean propeller, good trim, and avoid the squat. All of that is what you need. And this is, again, this is one of the core things we do in Wärtsilä. We do uh, deliver bridges and engines. Uh, we have a good standing in, in executing on, on these decarbonization things. Everything starts inside our uh, Wärtsilä FOSS, the fleet optimization software, where we help you perform um, first, the second officer are planning a route, and we help them with uh, all the passage planning and preparation of charts, etc. Then, as you execute the voyage, uh, you have the performance monitoring, uh, fuel efficiency, and then, as you come closer to the port, you start planning for your arrival. You make sure that uh, your arrival is perfect according to the. Uh, terminal and everything is ready for you. No time wasted at Anchorage. Also no delays. Further to that, we do have some uh, tools for situation awareness. 
collision avoidance uh, that can enhance the skills of the master and, um, and help him transfer that down to his juniors. We do see autonomous vessels, remote controlled vessels in the future. And of course, in our package, we also do deliver uh, simulation and training. And one of them you can try in our boot there where you can do a virtual arrival departure from the Stockholm uh, uh, Viking Line Stadsgården uh, terminal, if you would like to try. Now, all of this is in the hands of Vertical Voyage. Um, the entire fleet operation solutions, this is what you should be looking at at your first step of decarbonization. And of course, there are many competitors who do the same. And they would only ask you to check their math, check how do they calculate, how do they optimize, how do they check how your uh, individual vessel performs, and how do they learn from that and then forecast your uh, uh, optimization results. Now, a very important, very much pending topic for you guys is the new requirement coming on uh, after New Year's about the CII, the Carbon Intensity Indicator. Um, the basics of it, your ship's going to be considered fridges because it's going to have the same energy rating as you buy a, a household fridge today, uh, A, B, C, D, E. And as time progresses, the, the requirement to uh, be within one uh, frame of this is going to be increasingly harder for, for your ship to, to have a good rating. And it will come with some kind of penalty if you don't perform well. So what are we trying to do about this? Well, we move our CII calculator and insights into our Vertula FOSS, where the ship the short side and everybody involved uh, can see uh, how this uh, happens and, and what you can do about it. And basically, we are trying to give you three things in regards to this CII. The first part is visibility. Um, that it's transparent to the ship, to the chief engineer, to the captain, to the superintendent, uh, to the charter. What's going on on board? We, what is the data in and around this? Then, of course, the breakdown of these same numbers, the insights, and with that, also, of course, the extrapolation. What can you, as a ship owner, a manager, or a charterer, do to optimize this, to avoid penalties, to use the asset with the highest uh, earnings possible? So the first stage is to create the visibility. Uh, if you run 10, 20 vessels, probably one or two of them have outliers uh, that could be your vessel of concern. And with that, as a simple forecasting, if you change nothing, what happens this year, next year, the year after that? And then, of course, for a particular vessel, if you do nothing, when does it start to uh, hurt me? Um, and what can I do about it? Uh, up until the end of the year, for example. Once we've done this visibility on individual ships, the overview of the fleet, and the quick forecast on what happens next, we give you the insight. We break it down into details. Uh, in this example, we have, for example, um, that uh, how much was the vessel loaded versus ballast, how much time in port versus at sea, and what kind of speed did you do when you were at sea. Um, and then, of course, um, which of these things are in, on my table? Which of these things can I change? And if I can't change them, maybe I need to change my contractual obligations to, to my principal. Now, finally, stage three. Once you've seen what's going on, once you have ideas on, on how to solve it, now we do the planning ahead. How can we change this? Um, Ideas to improve your vessel uh, through time in port, average speed, uh, loaded versus ballast, all of these factors, tr so that you have indicators where you need to change. Um, as an operator, for the next voyage, what can I do? Can I change something? Can I um, uh, manipulate uh, to the point where I uh, uh, get a better CII rating? And of course, uh, pointing again towards Roger and his uh, team, 
if I can't achieve the CII rating I want to, what can I do? Is it time for a big investment to change, modify the vessel, or even start a new build program uh, to, get, to get the assets to the point where I want to be? Again, this is Vertzela Foss, uh, our uh, fleet optimization uh, suite, visibility, insights, and optimizations. Um, for the current pending topics you have at hand. But we are not at Dun, sir, for the sake of running existing ships. Well, maybe we are, but this is the mother of innovation. Um, Orland in Finland has been an innovator in the Roro segment. Here on Dun, sir, these guys have been innovators of the tanker segment. And with that, I trust they continue to innovate. Because in spite of what was said earlier today uh, from uh, the Swedish Maritime and from the Maersk Zero Emission Initiative, shipping is good. To transport goods at sea is one of the most efficient ways to move goods. So while they talk about us decarbonization, I agree with that, but we should also move goods to marine. And how can we do that? Aren't we already doing it? No, we're not. We are focusing on one thing and one thing alone, economy of scale. We try to move more goods with the same asset or a bigger asset with the same people. So we're working on cost and we're working on volumes only. Now, there are other ways of doing it. Um, we should shift to marine and we should look at smart ways to enable new shipping. And in Virtual Voyage, we have a lot of fun looking into these segments. And of course, one of the segments we're talking about is the autonomous and remote controlled vessels. And when I say that, it's not going to be the new uh, Tarnfjord vessel who was just about to leave or just left. She's never going to be uh, remote controlled or autonomous. Don't get me wrong, but we're going to create small point-to-point -point vessels like elevators creating new businesses where the roads are already full of trucks and the tracks are full of uh, railroad cars. That's where we have an opportunity. So if we um, look into this, there has always been an argument we need crew because one, we, we have a combustion engine. It will always need... Um, crew on board, and two, uh, we need a captain because nobody can replace the human eye. This has been the main argument against any form of unmanned or remote control vehicle. And I agree, Søren Sko, the CEO of Maersk at the time, uh, said, we're never going to have unmanned in my time. But he also said, on my ship size. If you are Maersk, your, your uh, vessel size is such that you don't care about crewing. It's a minor cost and it uh, gets back what you want. But if you go into small, medium, even to the tanker sizes these guys use, crewing cost is already a, a factor that is a competitive uh, key element. And if you go into the smaller ones, they don't exist anymore. We have actually eliminated all the smaller coasters from these coasts. In the Baltic, everywhere else, there's almost no coasters in the really small segment. The same segment these guys in Dunse started with. It's now gone because of labor cost. We can't compete with uh, roll, uh, ra <laughs> railroad and trucks. Uh, now, when it comes to the chief engineer, it's the same thing. Uh, we need a chief engineer because we have an internal combustion engine. But what if electric cars could also be electric ships? If we look at it, the suitability of an electric vehicle is really, really good if the trip is half an hour, one hour, two, three hours. If it goes longer, you would look at a hybrid solution uh, to do p uh, load variation and speed variations only. And if you look at a 10-day trip, forget it. But don't forget to pass the Stenaline Monter 
that their display, they actually have their electric vehicle on display there, which is intended for the Frederikshamn to Göteborg route, which is some 60 nautical miles or four hours. It's really, really interesting to see that they are planning for an electric vehicle of a four hour trip. But with an electric vehicle, you actually don't need a chief engineer. Now let's talk about whether we need the captain on the bridge 24 seven. When we talk about remote and autonomous vehicles, there is one conundrum. I can't talk about it because every project we're involved in, we're bound by an NDA. The same goes for our colleagues in Kongsberg uh, and the other guys. The only thing we can talk about is when it's EU funded, such as this guy here. We will build together with an industry consortium and funded by EU. Uh, public transport, I was going to say, a container feeder running in mixed environment uh, inside the port of Rotterdam between different container terminals, offloading the roads uh, there. That's one of the few things we do, we can talk about. But the next thing is this. Um, the captain is needed for to be a lookout. He's needed to be um, there with his eyes and his ears. So we actually invented the machine eyes. We didn't invent it, but we, we developed it to a point where it's marine and reliable. So what you see now is a camera pod. The camera pod has a 200 degree visibility horizontal and 113 vertical, meaning you, you can actually see from the ship side up to the horizon and above. Four of these fitted, such on a DFDS ship here, this is Selandia Seaways. She actually gets full coverage with camera view, with amazing quality, and compared to a human lookout, it does it 24-7, 365 at full attention. So if, if you look at it, it would look like something like this. It's not great on this camera display. It's actually better on my screen. You can come here and watch if you like. Uh, that one might actually also display it better. What we see is the camera pod at this point. The image is stitched. It's put together. And now we break it up to be the three individual cameras. Um, when you put cameras together, they warp slightly. Uh, so you might, for detailed view, want to, to break them up. Um, this is experimental still. We've sold the system to a total of 12 ships. Um, passenger ferries, DFDS, and a couple of container ships. And they all need it for docking, uh, situation awareness. You can also increase cargo intake if you have forward view past the containers. So here they are playing with um, uh, different views of the camera. And I will actually skip to the next one. And the camera resolution is actually so good that, and the calibration, so that you can measure accurately distances using the cameras only. And with that, I'm pacing, so you'll probably block your view all the time. Um, you, you get very, very accurate resolution. You get very accurate uh, distance measurement. Here we go with the bird's eye view. Anyone who has bird's eye view in their car will know that the bird's eye view is slightly confusing until you zoom in. Um, the higher up the cameras are mounted, the better the bird's eye view become, the less warping it is. Now, if you take this camera system, and for example, you happen to be an American customer who does trading in the, with Lakers in the inland waters of the US, they actually demand a lookout up front. And we made a system where they can replace this guy. So we actually took this camera system, and then we took one of our uh, near field radars, and we created a system where if you look carefully now, this radar detects two targets, and there's a third coming soon. And here you see in the camera system, that's a buoy, that's another buoy, and here comes a vessel. And as soon as the vessel comes inside the quarter nautical miles, it's highlighted here. 
And since this system is intended to be used on Lakers in really narrow uh, fairways, it warns as late as 500 meters. Because um, you normally don't uh, see further than that. So, what we do in Wurzel Voyage, apart from trying to decarbonize existing fleet, is to give the new and curious people opportunities to further uh, explore existing ships and uh, maybe create new vehicles, new ways of, of uh, developing uh, seaborne uh, shipping with small point-to-point -point transportation. I think I stopped there. No, I don't. If you want to try to do the docking in our boot, you will know that it's really, really hard to see through a vessel. From the bridge swing, you have excellent view of uh, the um, uh, side of the ship, but you don't see. It's a completely blind angle. If you install a camera system, suddenly your ship is made of glass, and you can see through it. This means that, for example, an Oasis-class cruise liner today has a bridge of 230 square meters of premium real estate front. We could replace that with a tiny navigation bridge and a maneuvering dome. A theater where you go into this theater, you have the docking instrument, and then you project the view you want to see. If you want to be uh, driving from the uh, port aft corner, you can. If you want to be uh, in the bow, you can. So you can move the docking team, pilot, captain, staff captain, to wherever you want. With this, my task for you guys now is to find me during the remaining three hours I'm here up until dinner and tell me why I'm wrong. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Again. Well, come here. Uh, I just want to have uh, one question before, because we have not so much time, unfortunately, but um, is it a, a possibly controversy in the, uh, with working with the, the, the plan to create unmanned vessels? Uh, and, and I think that the employees may think that I might lose my job. Uh, through that, wh who in here think that uh, re crew reduction will be making more mariners unemployed? It won't. What, what I'm trying to do is to create new business for shipping. And with this new business, we actually get different ways of working. Maybe for a time you work on board. Maybe for a time you work in a remote control center, monitoring ships. And then you come back to sea again when your child, children are slightly older. So, so I'm actually seeing that as an opportunity for more flexible working environment in the marine industry. Yeah. And you, Vesele is coming back. You are, you are, you are gold sponsor to the Onsen Shipping Meet this year. And you will come back. Uh, your colleague, Roger Holm, is coming here. At 3 o'clock. At um, 3 o'clock. He's still looking there already, trying to... <laughs> That's good. Yeah. So, thank you very much. A big thank hand you. to Jürgen Strandberg at Vesele. Thank you.